Hi, everyone. Hi, welcome. Welcome to the fourth and final in our Minister for the Future event series. I'm Alex Burns. I'm the Director of Discovery at Nesta. In our last episode, we welcomed Professor Sir David King, who spoke to us about the world of radical climate repair. And tonight, I'm delighted to welcome Dame Sally Davis, who's here to talk to us about healthcare in the modern age, and specifically her idea for a national health bank. If this is your first event with us, last year, Prospect and Nesta started a unique experiment. We invented a minister for the future. Now it's their job to anticipate the shifts coming over the horizon, be they technological, geopolitical or social, and to decide how we should respond to them. And then we brought the idea to life. We assembled a group of world leading experts, business leaders, campaigners, academics, and we asked them to fill our hypothetical minister's hypothetical red box with bold ideas that would challenge the status quo and be focused firmly on the future. And it's been fun. We got lots of great ideas back. And last year, about this time last year, we published them in a supplement to Prospect magazine. Beneath the fun concept, though, and it has been fun, especially kind of making this red box out of things assembled from Amazon and other kind of fun, fun things in the concept, there is a serious point. And that is that political debate on the left and the right feels increasingly focused on managing the present and can even feel backwards looking, despite kind of recent political slogans about long termism. So we really wanted to create the space to lift our heads and think big about the future. And that's what this event series is all about. At Nesta, we're focused on designing, testing and scaling long term solutions to some of society's biggest challenges from childhood inequality to public health to net zero. And for its part, Prospect has always championed bold ideas, especially those that cut across the political divide. And I'd like to take a moment to thank Prospect for this partnership over the past year, because it's been exactly what Minister for the Future was intended to be about. And uh, we've worked really well together. So thank you to our colleagues at Prospect. Given this is the last in the event series, I did also want to thank all of our previous panellists and audience members for participating in such thought provoking discussion over the past events over the past year. And I'm sure you'll all agree with me that tonight's topic, healthcare in the modern age, whilst it's about the future, feels increasingly urgent. And I'm really excited for tonight's discussion. I hope you agree it's a great way to round off the series. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, um, Alex. I'm Alan Rusbridge. I, I edit Prospect and um, welcome to Prospect Towers um, on the fourth floor in the, in the attic. Um, it's all very grand down here, but we, we toil away in the, in the attic. Um, and the, the little elves of Prospect are even now putting their finishing touches to the, um, the winter. No, it's not the winter. It is the, it's the New Year edition um, of Prospect, which I hope you will all buy when it comes out. Um, so welcome to all, all of you who have come in person. Welcome to those of you who are online. Um, uh, and uh, I just want to reiterate um, our thanks and uh, what a pleasure it's been to work with um, Lester on this great idea. So uh, I'm just going to do a few <coughs> introductions and explain how the evening is going to work. Um, first of all, we're going to hear from um, Dame Sally Davis, who it says here is the 40th Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, uh, and the UK Special Envoy on Antimicrobial Resistance. I don't know why that sounds difficult to say, but um, it's otherwise known as AMR. Um, and Dame Sally is going to um, talk for a bit from the lectern with slides, um, and she's going to present her proposal this evening, um, which is a proposal for a national health bank. Uh, and then we've got three experts, uh, a panel who are going to come along and uh, discuss, challenge, question, uh, or agree, um, possibly, uh, with her. Uh, we've got Professor Dame Carol Proper, the Professor of Economics at Imperial College Business School in the Department of Economics and Public Policy. Then we've got Professor Martin McKee, Professor of Public Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And then finally, we've got Dame, uh, Dr. V Dame, she will be a Dame, <laughs> um, only a matter of time. Dr. Victoria Betton is the Practice Director uh, at People Centred Design at SmartCo. 
So we're going to be looking at the future of medicine, how decision makers can ship a, shape a healthcare landscape uh, that enables equitable access to groundbreaking treatments. Your role this evening is you're, you're the minister, um, and um, at the end of the evening, you're going to have to vote on what you hear. Um, so you're going to have a, uh, uh, your, your chance during the course of the evening to also challenge and discuss the ideas, including the people online. Um, if you're online, please join the conversation in the comments box and ask questions in the chat, and um, uh, we will take them here. Closed captions can be accessed via the LinkedIn live stream. Uh, I think that's all you need to know. So remember, you've got you've got to pay attention because you're going to be um, in the hot seat. Uh, these people are going to try and persuade you. And I'm going to begin by asking Dame Sally to come and make her presentation. Thank you very much. So I'm clearly here a bit um, in the wrong place because I'm not talking about our National Sickness Service, the NHS. I'm talking about our health and a an asset that I think we should be investing in. And I think we need, think Bank of England, not a savings bank of national health, but a bank that actually helps develop health, as it were. Remembering, of course, that health is driven by social factors, spaces, physiology, and massively by commercial factors. So you've heard about social determinants. I don't talk about determinants, that's passive. I talk about drivers, social, genetic, physiological, but overall commercial matters. And I also would put to you the proposition that health has to be worked for by us as individuals, I groan when I go on my peloton by the community and arguably by the uh, nation. And why? Because, as you can see here, we're living longer but in worse health. And what you see in this graph, because I realise the graphs are quite difficult to see, is each um, block is a, is a morbidity, a chronic morbidity. And you can see as people get older, going to the right, um, they get more multi-morbidity. So living longer in worse health. And yet last century, we had the greatest increase in life expectancy and health due to slum clearance, Clean Air Act, tobacco control, child immunization, better food, so much. But life, healthy life expectancy didn't keep up. And actually it's healthy that really matters. Today, people live in more, longer, in poor health than they did in the 1990s. And so how do we in this century shift that unhealthy lifetime and make it shorter? We need to put life into life expectancy. And other countries really have had more success. The UK is that red dot. Do I have, I should have looked to see if I did. Um, bottom um, kind of left, the, re the real outlier, sorry, down here at the bottom, we've been left behind. We are the sick man of Europe and we're falling further behind year on year. I want to be optimistic. Um, Japan, Singapore and Korea in the last century really took their life expectancy and, and quality of life up. So it is possible to do and we've got to get on with it and make it happen. But let's just take a sidestep and say, why does good health matter? I would argue it's about contentment. You can talk about well-being, but Gus O'Donnell and others can't define it for me. It's about making life worthwhile. But health is vital to the strength of the UK economy. I've been working with Aradazi and the IPPR on um, um, a commission, and we can absolutely see that health matters. It, ill health harms our productivity, decreases our tax take, increases public health expenditure. So I've been arguing for quite a long time, and I'm arguing ever more strongly that health is actually our greatest untapped route to greater happiness, contentment and prosperity. And this is work 
that was actually done for a book that I published uh, with a young colleague, Johnny Pearson Stuttart, in November 2020 from the Institute of Fiscal Studies that shows that things have changed. In the past, education was linked to employment. Now, the most important factor in employment is good health. And so we need to make sure that people can have good health. That means we've got to think differently about health. I want to change us from this paradigm of the National Sickness Service and illness to a paradigm of health. If we go on doing the same thing, we're going to get the same result. We need, so we need to stop just thinking about illness and think about how to create the best possible health. We need to focus on what I've called in this book with Johnny, total health. That's about physical health, mental health, social health, and in the north of Europe, social health encompasses spiritual health. So I want us to have total health and build it, and we need to stop seeing sickness as a cost. We need to invest in health, seeing it as an asset. And as we invest in health, we strengthen society and our economy. <clears throat> the horrible thing is we actually know a lot about what needs doing. So we need to generate more evidence as we go. But why don't we start with what we know works? Food policy, pregnancy, early years, within workplaces, supporting physical activity, healthier homes, cutting pollution. Sure start worked. What we've got is a problem of willingness, a problem of getting on to do it. And this happens with these wicked problems across society. So I also wonder whether we can learn from the Climate Change Act. Can we have a Health and Prosperity Act setting as a mission not net zero, but being the healthiest nation of the world in 30 years, needing better institutions? The bank comes in here. But also, that bank will need money to spend on improving our health. So strategic investment in doing things to make health better. And the National Health Bank is perhaps a comparable mission-led approach. The Bank of England, I think, can teach us a lot. Their independent financial and monetary policy committees with power to set capital requirements and interest rates. Well, how about a Bank of Health with a health policy committee that looks at the return on investments of health interventions and policies over time, looking at the 15, 20, 30 year timescale for health, not an electoral timescale of two to five years. So then we do the right things. We need that committee to score the ROIs on economic benefit, giving other financial institutions and treasury the information they need. We could also look at the prudential regulation authority as an inspiration um, because of their role in supervision and stress testing financial institutions. Couldn't we get rid of the Care Quality Commission and start using data and get the bank to use the data in that sort of way? But that isn't so much what I want to talk to today. And that's where all of this, the National Health Bank, comes in, from inaction and short-termism to long-term progress, overseeing a long-term mission, the equivalent of net zero, being independent, and monitoring what's going on. As chief medical officer, I asked that the Office for National Statistics should develop um, a um, national health index. They've done it for four years. It's really helpful. They've run out of money. It may be stopping. We need GDP and next to it, our other asset, and uh, health and the National Health Index. But of course, the bank needs some money, doesn't it? Where would the money come from? Well, I think we, the taxpayer, are going to have to put some in. But we know from COVID that health matters to employers. So employers should either be looking after the health of their employees and their families and communities or paying. That's a pay or play model. And it's a classic economic model into money that can then be spent on health. That probably won't be enough. 
So I suggested that when I, whoop, when my children pay inheritance tax on, on me, that I should be investing in the long-term health through that inheritance tax of the future generation. So why not take 1% of inheritance tax and put it into the National Health Bank? So looking to improve health and investing. We need to set the expectations of the market and really move forward um, with money, three sources of money that I've talked about, taxation, pay or play from private, and the inheritance tax. I'm not anti-business at all. In fact, I'm quite pro-business. But I've spent quite a bit of time with different businesses who argue that regulation can help um, get a level playing field. We could do much more with, if we had a bank, things like the, um, um, the levy for uh, sugar in drinks. We, there are all sorts of things we could do like that as well. Why do we let companies that make um, products that harm health not pay the externalities. Surely we now know the concept of polluter pays. Can't we make sure that we're moving that sort of issue forward for health, which matters just as much, if not more, and matters to our um, uh, economy as well? Um, we need to, I'm going to skip that one, increase our capacity to invest in the best health in interventions. And I've suggested for starters that we might start with food, housing, um, preventive technologies for health and um, capital projects. But, you know, you can start wherever the return on investment would be good. You can look with a national bank at what you do nationally and what you get local banks to do locally. But just think about the money for health given to local authorities, the public health budget. When it started, it wasn't brilliant. It shrunk and shrunk. It's absolutely irrelevant now. We can't go that route again. We've got to do better. And here's one example the Good Food Programme run by Mission Ventures. They put in a 1.4 million initial budget. It was matched by 6 million from others. There are all sorts of ways we can do this. So my last slide, I want to sum up that we are falling behind. Something's got to change. And if a bank doesn't do it, give me something better. I don't mind. But this century needs a new approach, one that recognizes and invests in the potential of good and total health, focuses on wellness, not just sickness. And I think that a national health bank with the three different bits that uh, the Bank of England has could deliver a system where the NHS picks us up when we're sick, but we have the means to invest in things that will keep us well for as long as possible. We need better ways to deliver a fairer, more secure, and more prosperous Britain. Thank you. And I also want to thank Johnny and my colleagues at IPPR, particularly Chris Thomas, for the discussions and debates and the shared authorship of the book. Thank you. Um, who else has done this? Uh, no one has. So, uh, other countries, and Martin will be much better than me on this, uh, Professor McKee, um, have done things to improve the public's health, uh, but no one's done it in this sort of way, and on the grand scale that Britain needs. Why do we need it on a grand scale? Because we're the sick man. So we really need to, and you only have to look at obesity and all the illness that follows on from obesity to see that we've got to do something major. Have you spoken to West Streeting about this? Um, not yet. <laughs> I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> and is there anything you see in Labour's thinking that leads you to believe that they're prepared to think this big? Uh, no, not yet, which is a bit worrying. But on the other hand, they have got their health mission. And I think there are ways that they could think big. Um, and 
you know, when you come to this sort of thing as politicians, most of them haven't got the experience that some of us have of, of understanding the medical and illness side and yet seeing the bigger picture. And this needs the bigger picture seeing. And as we're going to hear, interventions which will help make my ideas much better, bringing the public into it and saying, this is for you so that you're more content, more prosperous, able to live better quality lives for longer. How long do you think it would take to set up? Oh, I think if you really were minded, you could get it going in a couple of years. And how would the NHS itself have to change? Well, the less structural change we put on the NHS, the better. But I would um, start to, uh, to move to reviewing its security and sustainability through um, data. And I think once you start to really move on the public's health and reducing obesity and um, other things, you can then start to look at how do we innovate and deliver much more patient-focused services wrapped around them. I think care in the community needs quite a big change because GPs are struggling. And actually, we need, with people who have multimorbidities, the, this idea of polyclinics where you go and everything's sorted and you get your diagnostic tests and everything there in the community. And there are some quite interesting experiments about that. The, 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 the jury's still out as to whether it was a good idea to give the Bank of England quite the dependence, independence that it's got. How independent would your bank be? Um, well, I would give it independence because what we've got at the moment is pretty ghastly. But this is about the public's health. The NHS, the sickness service, will never be truly independent because it is such a massive chunk of our GDP that the politicians will always be on the hook for it. But at the moment, they pretend it's independent and it isn't, and the whole th and there's next to no accountability. And that's why I think the National Health Index is important. That's why I think the idea of using kind of a bank type stress testing and data and everything to see how people are doing, and much more transparency and moving in that direction. If it is independent, how, does it, how is it accountable? How is it accountable? Um, so I'm going to have to ask the economists that. Come on, you're going to have to come and tell me how to make it accountable. Okay. Well, uh, how is the Bank of England accountable? Not very. Really. Well, there we are. Um, and actually, the House of Lords has just said it's done a bad job, hasn't it? Um, but it's probably done better than politicians would have done. Well, yeah, that, that's, that's the debate, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I mean, we, we know that the, one of the problems with the health service, the so-called health service, what you call the sickness service, is, is, the, is the rising, as, as the medicine gets better and more advanced, it becomes vastly more expensive. How, how does your bank cope with those spiralling costs? Well, if, if we really got on to the public's health and helped them live healthy lives, we would delay many cancers, most diabetes, most heart disease, then they'd need these more expensive interventions, which are more successful generally for much many shorter years. So in the end, you could probably work out an economic model where it wouldn't cost a lot more. And at the same time, because people were healthier, we'd have a more prosperous Britain with a better tax return to pay for it. There you are. You see, it'll work. <laughs> Do you lump in, because everyone knows that the, the mental health services are grossly underfunded and also social care is grossly underfunded. Do you take this moment to lump it all in, in which case it's been going to be quite a shock, isn't it, in terms of the expense of... I have not lumped those in. I have talked about the public's health, which is not sickness. I do think that um, employers and all sorts of people can help with um, everyday mental ill health. Um, psychiatric illness has not risen and still needs psychiatrists in the NHS. But a lot of it is about debt and stress and uh, help through work and communities can really help that. My final question before we invite our panel of experts out. 
I mean, you've worked closely with politicians and you understand what's sellable and what's not. The idea of taking, uh, a, even if it's just 1% of inheritance tax at a time when politicians are talking about lowering it or abolishing it, is that politically doable? Uh, I don't think it would be under this government, would it? But the reason I suggested that one, and it maybe needs more than 1%, is because actually one of the things that um, interested me during COVID was how many older people were saying, yes, I don't want to catch it, but actually I want my children to have a good future and their children. A lot of old people really do want to invest in their children and grandchildren. And it isn't always just by handing money on. If it is by uh, their, their personal money on to them, if it is by generating a healthier, more contented, more prosperous society, I believe there's a good sell to be done. You need just slightly more visionary politics, politicians than maybe we've been lucky to have in the last few years. Maybe. Maybe. Right. Experts, please come on and, and, and join us. So why don't we um, go from the far right or the far left, depending on, your, on your, um, <laughs> uh, where you're sitting. Um, Carol, respond in any way you want, okay. with, 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 with questions or with counter-proposals or, or whatever. Thank you. The floor thank, is yours. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Sally. That's, I think this is very exciting, so let me start with this. <laughs> I think the investment focus is fantastic that you bring to this. We do invest in our health. Our health is one of our major capitals. Health capital allows us to work. Health capital allows us to have community. Health capital allows us, as Sally says, to live a longer life. But it is an input into everything when you think about it from a production point of view. But there's also the feedback the other way that work and employment and where you live and your working conditions all feed into health. So having this productivity lens is a really good way of bringing those two strands together. And it automatically means that you think not just about taxation and spending by central government, but you think about the role for housing, you think about the role for employment and employers and food producers and all the kind of things Sally's done. So I think this lens is a really welcome lens, a move from a narrow focus on cure, which all of the health service is obsessed with, to an understanding of productivity. And productivity is what's going to what get Britain out of the deep hole it's in. We have terrible productivity in this country, not just the productivity of public services, but also the productivity of a lot of our um, non-public services. And thinking about health as an input into that is fantastic. So you've got a bank, your idea is a bank that focuses on productivity and puts funds to that end. And you do have something that I think I think might be a little problematic that in a sense you're focusing both on spending and regulation and having the regulator doing the spend. You've got a lot of regulatory roles that you're suggesting there. You're suggesting looking at outcomes. You're suggesting at holding employers uh, accountable. You're thinking of holding local authorities accountable because if local authorities have got really polluted streets, they're accountable for that. But at the same time, you've got spending. And I don't think putting spending and a regulator together are a good idea. You end up with something the economics calls regulator capture. You end up with big lobbies lobbying the regulator to do what they want. One of the big lobbies is the NHS, mm -hmm. <laughs> but there are other big lobbies. So I think you've got really an idea, I think, about regulation. And when you talk about the parallels with the bank, it's the regulatory functions of the bank that you're talking about. So I think what you're talking about is regulatory functions, and then you're talking about an income stream that comes into the whole area of spending on public health. That income stream I'm thinking of is really what an economist would call a hypothecated tax. A tax that's for a particular purpose. That's what hypothecated taxes are for. And you can draw that tax source from a number of places. You can draw that tax source from employers, as you say, your play or pay. You can draw it from any other forms of taxation. I don't see your split between inheritance tax and other taxes as very relevant. In fact, inheritance tax doesn't bring in very much. 
The only place that inheritance tax plays a nice role, except that everybody hates it, is that if it kind of gets people focused on this is something you're giving to your children, which I think mm. Victoria is going to talk about public acceptability, and that's where the sources matter. So I think you need to think separately about regulation and spending. You also, I think, if you're going to work this out, need to tell me how much money is needed. <laughs> how much does this bank need to have or how much do these hypothecated taxes need to raise? Um, so I think that, and I'd also say that, you know, in, in essentially what you're moving towards is what Martin reminded me, and I've worked with them a lot, is the Productivity Commission in Australia. This Productivity Commission is responsible not just for productivity in the private sector, but also in the public sector and looking across these sectors. I think learning from those ideas, you asked Alan, has anyone else done it? I think the Australians have sort of done it with their productivity commission. And I think I'll leave, I think that's probably my time up, but the questions, I have many more questions, but I'm <laughs> sure that both Martin and Victoria are going to raise ones. But I would, I would my final question would be, some of this is going to be very contentious. Issues around housing, for example. We need to be building more housing rather than subsidizing housing. We need to be expanding the supply of housing. So your bank is going to have to be <coughs> dealing with some very contentious things. How are you going to deal with that? Oh, I'll stop there. Boldly. <laughs> <laughs> Move on, yes. Shall we, shall we see, see your thoughts on, on those issues before we move on to Martin? So the, the first, first question is, do you, do you agree that there should be a split between spending and regulation? I, I had seen a split between them. Um, and when I look at the original table we did, there was the, uh, the bank bit and then the health policy bit and then the health regulation authority. So they, had, they were different bits. Um, I take your point, we could actually separate them and have a national budget for investment and um, the other, um, and we might call it something different. But yeah, um, so I'd see that. I hadn't worked out how much money. I need some economists. And, uh, I didn't have any around. when, And I quite like the idea of actually linking it much more to other things that relate to productivity. I think that would be a a quite nice idea. So we need to think through whether that would be a better way forward. And how do you avoid regulatory capture? By separating them is what you said, isn't it? I think separating helps. helps. I mean, I think regulatory capture is everywhere. And um, you just have to be, I mean, you know, in a sense, some of the, the arguments against what the Bank of England have done have been have the flavor of regulatory capture. I just think when you invent a regulator and you want a really powerful regulator here, you want a regulator who's going to regulate, in a sense, the public well, business, sector, the yeah. private sector, yeah. and indeed, in some ways, the NHS itself. Yeah. Because if clinicians keep sucking money back into the yeah. hospital sector, you don't want them to do that. And yeah. I think I agree about that. So you are going to have to avoid lobby, or rather, you're going to yeah. have to work out how you deal with lobbying how you make it. I wouldn't have a doctor run it, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, well, that. <laughs> but Carol, when you mention housing, you're going to put lob the housing into this as well. Well, Sally lobbed the housing. I did. Into this. Yeah. And so I'm then, saying. But this suddenly becomes an enormous. Well, that's. that's um, it becomes is there some, as powerful as the Treasury. Uh, it? Mm, uh -huh. Well, productivity <laughs> is what the Treasury should be about. Um, is some of this about how you influence as well? rather than actually spending the money. I think so, and I think that's why the idea of a bank is, you know, having this, it's the, 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 the kind of excitement of something different helps influence, helps guide, helps think about things. Yeah. I don't think you'll probably end up with a bank in quite the way you're thinking about no. the bank, but I think the, the idea is really exciting and, and gathers together all these ideas that are around that we really have to tackle in Britain before we go off to be, you know, at the bottom of some all week tables. Yeah. Can I just ask you about mm. hypothecated taxes? Mm. Because yeah. they were a sort of big thing about 10 years ago. Why did they disappear well, off the political the, spectrum? The problem about hypothecated taxes is everyone is very happy to hypothecate their taxes 
to something they care about. Mm. So one of the things is that, you know, people often talk about, let's have hypothecated taxes for the NHS, because the NHS is a religion in England, and everyone deeply believes in the NHS, even if, I mean... So, but the problem then is for a government, if you've got a pot of money that has to go to the NHS, and you've got falling tax revenues, it means you've got to take away money from other places. Now, the current government has believed in actually doing that, but not all governments believe in that. And so if you hypothecate for something popular, you tend to have a problem that unpopular areas don't get funded from a pot of taxation, particularly if your tax revenue But doesn't gone. a hypothecated tax mean that you can put that particular tax up rather than start sucking Well, you elsewhere. could put that tax up, but you'd probably have to drop other taxes because people you don't want to mm. increase people's tax take. So the tendency is, given that nobody likes paying taxes and all governments like to be as low tax as possible unless they've got some very good ideas about how to spend it that people believe in, the problem about hypothecated taxes is you end up, yes, directing your taxes towards you what you've hypothecated, but you spend less in la other areas. Yeah. And that's why people tend to argue against hypothecated taxes. I think what you're doing here, Sally, is arguing by the back door for a hypothecated tax for the health of the public. Yeah, I think I am. And I think you need to think about what the downsides of that are. Yeah. And also, I think the health of the public is slightly less popular than the NHS. Oh, it is. But, and that's why we don't get the funding we need. Well, it to is. So, will a hypothecated. The food system and everything. So, yeah. will a hypothecated tax for that work? So, I think that's what you need to kind of be working through here. Yeah. Martin, can I just stick with hypothecated taxes just for a minute? Because I think there are a lot of arguments against them. Uh, obviously, the Treasury don't like them, but you do want to have some sort of democratic control over spending. And this is a situation where when you set it up, in, in effect, you're saying, well, that's what we will spend forever in the future. And you can find that you've got more money than you need or less. And the problem is that many of the health issues are countercyclical. So that the time that you need the money, your tax revenues are falling. But I think we see the problem in local government in the UK, where they have lots of little pots that are allocated from the centre, hypothecated for certain things, and then they find they either run out of money in the year or they can't spend it. Now, that's with the fragmentation of hypothecation, which I, I think is a problem. So um, I, I would be a little bit um, cautious over that. But going back to my, maybe my main point is that I think that this is, uh, the concept is one which is particularly important for the UK. But the reasons it's important for the UK are the same reasons that it will probably be impossible to achieve. Uh, I'm, I just I haven't started reading it yet, but Gwyn Bevans just sent me his new book, which is basically 100 years of failures of governance in the UK. And I've recently read Danny Dorling's one, which is, is rather similar. And, uh, you know, we are the only country in the OECD as John Byrne Murdoch has shown, that has not recovered the workforce after the COVID pandemic. We've been getting losing more and more people. Every other of the 38 countries is in a downward trajectory. We're the only one. Your data on life expectancy, that was the work again, Danny Dorling, Lou Hyam and myself did. When we were arguing, we were saying we're, we're being left behind. The first evidence we showed was 2013, but 2015, it really got bad. And ministers have been looking for every excuse to yeah. To, to undermine, to say, well, it's something else, you know, look here and so on and so forth. We haven't really accepted the fact that we are in a terrible situation. And whether it's infant mortality, maternal mortality, old age mortality, whatever, you know, we are a real outlier with the United States, which is not a place that we want to be. But the conditions that allowed us to get into that situation with outside London, again, John Byrne Murdoch's work, you know, when you take the UK, London out of the UK, Essentially, this is a country with the economic development of Mississippi. So we've got real problems here. And how you actually then get people to take these issues seriously, I, I think, is a great challenge. You asked, had anybody done it elsewhere? And I think the, um, first of all, back in 
20 years ago, we wrote a report for the European Commission. We looked at the contribution of health to economic growth. And, you know, we made the evidence that measured by hourly wages, healthier people are more productive. They stay in the labor force longer. They work more hours per week. They invest more in their own education and healthy families invest more in small and medium enterprises. All of those pathways are clear. And then we developed it in the first of the Tallinn conferences in 2008, where we showed the mutually beneficial virtuous circle that you can create between health systems, health and wealth, economic growth. Yeah. And of course, then 2010, the politicians in this country and a few others tested that by doing exactly the opposite of what we called for, <laughs> by imposing austerity and got turned of what could have been a virtuous circle into a vicious downward circle. And we, you know, the health system, the economic situ situation, all of those things got worse. <clears throat> but there are other countries that do take it seriously. Finland, in the 2006 um, European Union presidency, again, the work we did to inform them on health in all policies. Now there, the argument was that if you can get health, other sectors contributing to health, transport, education, and so on, that will alleviate the burden on the health service. It will also increase your economic growth. Um, but, uh, and the Icelandics and, and others who've been looking at the well-being economy. So there, there has been that discourse around, but it hasn't got wider traction, I think. And part of that is because we do have a fixation on, you, you talked about what makes life worthwhile. Well, that immediately brings to mind Bobby Kennedy's quote from 1963, GDP measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile, he said. And, um, and we, we know that we're measuring the wrong things. You've got the National Health Index. <coughs> There's a whole series of other measures that we could use, and I think we need to look at that. But part of the problem is, of course, that everything is sort of misaligned. We do have management of mental health in this country. The problem is that it's done in the criminal justice system. It's not done in the health service. So just in the same way that the criminal justice system is picking up the failures of the NHS, the NHS is picking up the failures in other sector and policies and other sectors. And I think that we have a long way to go to, to do something about that. I think the issues that you touch on on investment, we absolutely, we've had a dearth of investment um, in, in the UK more generally. And that's why our schools are literally falling apart the rack and so on. We've got, we haven't invested in staff. We haven't invested in, in all sorts of things. Digital infrastructure, you could go on and on and on. And we're way behind other countries, way behind other countries. So I think uh, that that is a real challenge. You give a couple of examples of where you can invest in certain programs. I think a lot of what you need, what can be done, doesn't need investment because it is regulation. You talked about the polluter pays and so on. I think if people are polluting, we should stop them polluting. The reformulation, the um, sugar tax, look, as you know, the goal of the sugar tax is not to make sugary drinks more expensive. It's to get the producers to take the sugar out of their drink. And they did that and it worked, but it doesn't necessarily bring in more revenue. And most, many of the things that we need to do, gambling, huge health impact of gambling in this country. It's a completely socially non-productive activity. It contributes absolutely, I mean, basically a way of transferring billions from the poorest people in society to a handful of billionaires for no social benefit whatsoever. That could be regulated. Having a gambling levy is completely irrelevant. I mean, they just change the odds. But we need to do something that is actually tackling the fact that you know, gambling is, is now so pervasive with children. And that's regulation rather than spending money. But can we actually do anything in this country? And I think that's where we get into the issue of accountability because we have fictions around accountability. <clears throat> I've written about the General Medical Council and a theoretical accountability to the Privy Council. It's nonsense. It's not accountable to anybody. Many of our bodies are not actually accountable to anybody. So how do you get that democratic input into it? But I think you also have a challenge with an executive in this country that hates being accountable to anybody. It hates being accountable to Parliament. It hates being accountable to the courts. The state under the rule of law, an idea that we thought had been established in the French Revolution, you know, just doesn't actually altogether apply here. We've got a Home Secretary or a former Home Secretary who thinks that you can just, you know, make things up as you go along, state that Rwanda is safe and it will, it makes it so. So the idea that we would have our politicians bring in another body that would hold them to account in the court of public opinion you know, you've got Liz Truss having a fiscal event without an OBR report, I think is quite difficult. 
And I would argue that's one of the reasons why we've got into the mess that we're in, because we don't have, you know, the fact that you can come up with an education bill, put it in the floor of the house, and then withdraw it because it's full of spelling errors, as happened a few years ago. You know, this is just binge lawmaking, as some judges once described it. <laughs> so we've got a huge problem here. And uh, I, 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 that's where I, I think we've got the difficulty. I think we actually need to sort out our constitutional settlement and our governance here, because I think we have a crisis of governance. And that has created many of the problems that I think need to be uh, resolved. If I was writing the headline on that, um, it would be a nice idea, but it's never going to happen. No. Well, you know, I'm pessimist. I mean, my view of the UK <laughs> at the minute is, uh, well, my middle name should be Cassandra, um, <laughs> but Cassandra was right. And, um, you know, my, my, the analogy I use, and some of my family members are in the audience, they will cringe, is Argentina 1910. 10th largest economy in the world, made a lot of mistakes and went steadily downward. If you look at our life expectancy data, and much of my early work was on the collapse of the health effect of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the earliest research coming out in the early 1980s saying there is a problem here was looking at the health data at a time whenever the strategists, the economists were saying, the Soviet Union is going ahead, it's closing the missile gap, it's you know, got Sputnik, it's doing really, really well. And the health people and the demographers were saying, hold on a minute, it may be doing those things, but actually, and that was why primary, the primary care conference in, Alma, in Almaty in, in the 1980s, the Soviet Union was saying, look, we can actually, you know, they, 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 were, they were drawing attention to, you know, to, 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 to health as an issue, there were real challenges around that. So I think the, 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 the health was really a problem uh, there that it was a, an indicator that something had gone terribly wrong. And when you look at our data, the fact that since 2016, our life expectancy has diverged so far from Ireland, which we tracked in parallel for many, many years, that's a real warning that something's going terribly wrong. And so much of the country is being completely left behind. We talk about Blackpool as the example, but Chris Whitty's report about the coastal towns. These are, this is the, the rust belt you see in the United States, the deindustrializing place, and it has political consequences because as Jacob Bohr showed at Harvard, those were the places voted for Trump. As we showed, those are the places that voted for Brexit. We also showed that that deteriorating health and austerity was associated with the vote for the National Socialists in Germany in the 1920s and 30s. You know, so that creates other problems too. Sally, do you want to respond to any of um, <laughs> So I'm left, I, I mean, like you, I'm very concerned, both about our governance, um, having watched over the last few years, but also about the nation's health. And what I set out to do was think, what could we do that would be sufficiently disruptive that it, it stood a chance of having an impact? Um, and I do think we need some disruption to move away from the sickness paradigm and to think about, I mean, you can call it inequalities, but fairness across this nation. It is an unfair nation. And I think we've got to generate some money to improve that fairness and improve the health of those who are not as well educated, who live in Blackpool. I, I too know the smoking mm. pregnancy data and stuff about Blackpool. So... If it isn't the bank, what is it that's disruptive enough that we stand a chance of getting better fairness about health that should then translate into all those other good things that we've talked about? Because I fear a gradual descent. I think people in this country, uh, unless you read the FT, and here, shout out to John Byrne Murdoch um, and uh, also Tim Harford with his paper, uh, his piece on the, the doom loop that he, he talked about the other day, probably don't realise that you know, we are the most unequal country in Europe, bar Bulgaria. We have a real problem. And this huge gap between London and the rest of the country which is much, much greater than any other major European country. And I, I just don't think that's, um, that, that's fully understood, along with our really very worrying health statistics. Yeah. Victoria, can you cheer us up? Uh, maybe. <laughs> you can call me Dame, by the way. I'm, I'm, open, to that, uh, I'm open to that moniker. Um, 
So I have worked in and around the NHS for the last 30 plus years. So that's the sort of lens I'm going to bring to my um, reflections. And I'm a, I'm a social worker by training. I now work with the NHS in digital transformation with a focus on human factors. So um, bringing um, participation and human factors to big service changes. Um, and I'd like to reflect something around sort of policy versus what it's like in the NHS and that sort of disconnect. Um, something around social determinants, which have already been mentioned. And then finally, something around public trust and data. Um, so I was with a group of clinicians in South East London today, training them in user centred design. And over lunch, I took the opportunity of having them um, in front of me to ask them what they thought about the health bank. <laughs> and um, they were um, really positive about the ambition, that disruption that you um, describe. And I think particularly taking things out of an electoral cycle. Um, but they also had very immediate concerns um, around the levers that don't work at the moment that could be changed, I guess, irrespective of a bank or not. So those short term annual budget cycles that you'll be very familiar with. The fact that the money, the rhetoric is around public health and prevention, but all the money flows to, uh, to the acutes. So um, we talked a little bit about the disconnect that they feel, and I think I have experienced working both at national, regional and local levels between the policy world and the day-to-day -day and reality. And there has to be a connection between them, I believe, because real change happens in real work. Um, we do have integrated care systems now that are emerging, and I believe that's the right way to go. I think we need to organise ourselves at that sort of regional level. And I think when you work at a regional level, you work through trust and you work through relationships and they are bringing all the sectors together. So I wonder what the relationship might be between that sort of policy level disruption that you're thinking about and then that regional and that local level and the relationship between them. I'm very nervous about any money going anywhere national when everything's on fire at a local level. So I would rather, if, if I had to choose when the money went, I'd want it to, it to go to helping localities thrive, um, but with the right policy context, which I think you're talking about. Um, we've touched on social determinants in a number of different ways. And I was thinking about the fact we all know that um, the social determinants of health are largely driven not by health services. 90% is our housing, our sense of community, our employment, our whatever, jobs. Um, and so building on an earlier point, I guess the bank will have to have a huge remit and authority over multiple, all parts of government really. So I was curious about that. Um, and how that might work. And then um, data. So you mentioned get rid of the QC, uh, CQC and we'll use data. But we know that there are big public concerns about use of data for secondary purposes. So the Health Foundation um, produced a report recently that said one in five people are concerned about data use for secondary purposes. Um, and we know that young people are much less likely to trust the NHS than um, older people and the government is trusted even less than that. Um, and we know that there's health inequalities in there as well because people who are on lower incomes have much more distrust. And I've been in some hospitals recently talking to patients where there are wild conspiracy theories about chips in heads and all sorts of things going on. So there's something about the quality of conversation and debate we have about data. So I think there's a real challenge but a real opportunity to engage with the public around data and if I was if I was your wing woman with the uh, health bank I'd be encouraging you to think about public deliberation and public um, engagement particularly in the light of care.data and now we have the federated data platform and that's <coughs> created a whole load of hoo-ha <laughs> so um, so yeah so so some reservations about um you know, PHE has been and gone. We had NHSX for those of us in the NHS and that went pretty quickly. All it did was more, add more complexity in the system as far as I um, can see. So I wonder whether we've exhausted our existing levers and whether we can work better or at least um, we need to be working with the levers we have available to us. Um, and finally, um, I just wonder if I'm a big fan of sort of systems thinking and there's this 
amazing person called Myron Rogers, who's a, a learning systems person. And he has a series of seven maxims, and I'd encourage you to um, Google them or use an internet search engine of your choice to check them out. But one of the things he says about enabling change in complex systems is, the process you use to get to the future is the future you get. So whatever shape this might take, I think the process will be as important as the destination. And as an advocate of people-centered approaches and human factors, I'd really, I'd really love to see anything that emerges, whether it be a bank or otherwise, has public deliberation, accountability um, at its heart, because I think that would give it a license to operate that was with the people of the country. So yeah, those are my reflections. Very helpful. I absolutely agree about um, the process and the need for the public and patient involvement. I was the one that dreamt up and set up the National Institute for Health Research, and we put patients and the public you at the centre it as we went forward. And that was one of the reasons it worked. It's become a bit bureaucratic, but it's still working. Um, I, I think that the NHS has tried all sorts of things with arm's length bodies and quangos and spent a lot of money to not much gain, really. Agreed. Um, but I'm not talking about our sickness service. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about what, when I was young, was called health in all policies. How do we get every bit of government, every bit of the private sector, to pull together to improve the health of everyone. Mm -hmm. And it, so it's a very simple concept, but we've not ever cracked it. And that's, I suppose, why I went for a bank, because what do we want? We want transport to be widespread and make it easy to be active and green, and then health will improve. Um, less pollution, more activity. We want a good food system, getting rid of food deserts and not too many fast food outlets. And that is regulation um, driven. But also, do we need, I've often pondered on the concept of an in-supermarket subsidy where you tax the processed products and that tax then goes straight through in the same shop to subsidising the uh, fresh products or something. But what we haven't done is managed to achieve much of this, of the sugar levy. And so you then go back to what is the disruptive move that then pushes everyone, and I think it is a mission that we want to be the healthiest in 30 years, and then some real reform that gives someone the power to push every government department to do what they should and push employers. So employers look after their people's health and look at products. And if they're harmful to health, they fund the externalities. They fund the downstream health costs um, in some way or other. So that's where the idea came from. And I think I absolutely agree with you. I'm, I'm, I prefer local mm -hmm. to national. But I think we need that push nationally, yeah. and some of the money would come in nationally, and I hope that they would. It gets enacted it. through the regions. I, I very much hope, um, yeah. or through the cities or, or mm. towns. And I think um, that uh, I would give more to the more deprived areas because they need it more. Mm. I know that in the middle of London we have very deprived as well, so don't get me wrong, but somehow we've got to do that. And I haven't seen anyone find a way through the NHS to do it. I haven't seen any country really do what I, such a big effort as I want of getting health into all policies. So that's where I, how I came to this. But yeah. It's for the public, so they have to be involved, yeah. definitely at the local level and ideally um, all the way up through it. Yeah. And I think the, um, I don't know how other people in the audience felt, but when you state that ambition, you know, but being the healthiest nation, that's like quite exciting. So I think there's something about, maybe that's the optimism. Do you know what I mean? We can all sort of galvanise around well, we an exciting challenge. If we really set yeah. our minds to it, <coughs> you know, and all of us in this room can see the need for it. So I don't mind if we drop the idea of a bank in the bin, but then what are we going to do? How are we going to make the change? Mm -hmm. 
Before we, we're going to come to, um, I hope you're all still awake and paying, paying attention and, and <laughs> full of uh, brilliant questions, because remember, you're, you're going to make the ultimate decision. Is there anything before we come to questions that, that anybody on the panel wants to pick up from what you've heard? You did mention housing, and I think we don't need to spend a lot of money because houses are being built, not enough houses, but we just need to make sure they're built to proper standards. Yes. And in the mid-1980s, under the government at the time, they took away a lot of the regulations. So our housing is the coldest in Europe. It is the worst thermal uh, retention of any country. We've got horrendous winter mortality that other countries just don't have. So you just need to change the building regulations. But the problem is that, of course, the building companies are some of the biggest political donors. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So we do need some independence in yes. this system. Yes. Yeah. Or we've got regulatory capture. Yeah. I recognise it there. I hadn't seen it in what I was saying. Yeah. Thank you. Now, Izzy, you're, you're watching online. Are there people online who've got questions? If, yeah. if so, uh, Joe, can we have... Oh, you've got a microphone. No. You need a microphone. Hi. Yeah, so the questions coming through online are um, around what um, Dr. Victoria was saying about having the, the community interest. So um, one of the questions was um, someone has got an, an, an initiative that they've been working on called Community Chest about social prescribing and total health, but their biggest challenge is um, being sustainable and finding long-term support for the community and how to pr uh, improve the effectiveness of investments. And another question we had was, where do you see the role of health charities in all of this? And finally, a third question are, how are diverse voices and views, including patients and the community, part of this work? Mm -hmm. Do you want to take the first question? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, they're all, I mean, I, I don't have the answer to the first question, um, but I think they're all really valid um, and important questions. And I think we briefly had a chat about governance before, um, before the session today. And um, I wonder, Sally, what your thoughts are about governance and public accountability and whether civil society organisations are part of that governance or they're able to influence. Um, and there's something about governance and accountability in terms of decision making. And then there's also about how do you engage with diverse communities to generate your evidence. So some of that evidence will be data um, that will be collected in all sorts of different ways, but some of it will be through qualitative methods, through community engagement and making sure as as you pointed out, that the more the poorer communities, the more excluded communities are able to have a, a, a voice that balances out those that are less um, deprived or, or marginalised. So I think there are two levels of answer. One is that we need evaluation built into all of this to, in order to be able to cal calculate return on investment. Far too often, uh, public health efforts have been made that haven't been evaluated or haven't been put in in a structured way so, so that people say, I am attempting to do this, I'll know if I've succeeded because this will happen, I can measure it in this way, now I'm going to do it and measure it before and after. And we've got to have a much more evaluative, structured approach to investment as we go forward. Otherwise, where would we be? Which would argue for what uh, these days is called a what works group people a group of experts who collect the evaluations, fund some, and make sure you get that. On the governance, yeah, well, I clearly haven't worked it all out. I do think that uh, where it becomes very important that you've got public involvement is on prioritisation. Mm -hmm. So I think at the centre, you don't so much need um, the public because what you're looking at is relative returns on investment and where it's worth investing. But then as you give money to regions and areas, they need that, but they also need um, to be able to prioritise and say, well, we haven't got the manpower or, and you're not giving us enough money and we can't add enough at this point to do everything. So this is the one we're going to start with and then we'll move on to that. So I do think there's a role. It's just, you know, first there's the economics of return on investment, then there's the prioritisation. Question in the audience. From the audience, questions? Yeah, from here. Hi, um, Rebecca, Rebecca McKee from the Institute for Government. I just wanted to um, 
pick up on some of the things you said, but we recently did some research looking at um, levelling up, which is like a similarly cross-cutting issue also to climate change. And you mentioned some of the, the Climate Change Act and our work looked at how you try and wrangle the centre to do this work, the centre of government and Whitehall, recognising how difficult it is. Um, and it's an issue that similarly is cross-cutting across Whitehall, but it's also cent central to local. Um, we looked at the role of um, an advisory plus kind of body, which is less ambitious than what you're presenting, um, but similarly encourages central government to work together, provides advice on good outcomes and metrics, and, and importantly is keeping the government accountable. So we looked at the Climate Change Committee and, and some of the things that I think work there is a very strong, well-resourced, they have a great chair, um, but they're also accountable to Parliament and that kind of independence, their accountability lines is really important. But also the element of public trust, which is where I might challenge you to think a bit more broadly about the role of the public. So in my previous job, I worked for Involve Public Participation Charity and we ran a Citizens' Assembly in 2019-2020 on net zero and that has helped inform what Parliament has done in some of the select committees, but also the Climate Change Committee. Um, so really I'm thinking about how you create something that is trusted, because that lends that public legitimacy. It has mm. teeth, um, people listen to it, and how you hold it accountable. And, and I was wondering how you envision something like this, doing those things, I guess, off the, the bat, given the kind of inhospitable environment that we've talked about politically. Yeah. Um, kind of what elements of those are maybe the most important to get going straight away? So, I mean, there's a lot to learn from the things you've talked about. And, uh, you know, anyone who was setting it up would be ill-advised not to look at your experience and, and other people's experience. The only real experience I can draw on is when, as the Director General of Research, I decided we should set up the National Institute for Health Research. And let me tell you, most of the academic world were against it, most of the NHS. Mm -hmm. And the reason we got there was because I played it on values and brought in the public. And it, clear, it was clear I was totally value-driven about it. And we got there. And now all the old men who were against it say it was their idea, of course. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think there is something about the chairmanship, the values, and the playing it out, and how do you bring in the public who care about this? But it's it's a difficult road, I remember. Just to jump in, I, I love citizens' assemblies as a as an approach. So, you know, representative group, you, it's an educative, deliberative process, and you'll and you'll get the people who are the detractors as well, but you want the detractors yeah. in the room oh. too, because it's the process of deliberation, dialogue and education and informed debate that actually gets you gets you where you need to be. So I'd encourage the Health Bank to do some of that. Sure. Can I, can I add something to that, which is from the Finnish kind of experience that Martin talked about, which is one of the things the Finns did was run a lot of things at local level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of local community involvement a lot of local community decisions about what they were going to focus on. And it's been very successful. And I think one of the unsuccesses of the UK is its constant centrification that's been going on for 50, 60 years, but maybe 30, 40 years. Certainly Tony Blair increased it. And I think if, if a, a radical initiative is going to succeed, it has to have very strong local yeah. input from the very beginning. And Finland is a really good example in so many ways. We might ask, why was it one of the countries that did probably better than almost anybody else during the pandemic? First of all, it has the local situation. Of course, it has had a challenge because it has had local government reform in the few years, but last few years. But it's also the fact that at central level as well, everybody knows one another. And this was brought home to me. At a, I was at a friend was retiring in Helsinki, and I was at a meeting, a conference to, to sort of celebrate him. And we went to dinner at his house afterwards. And there was a senior health people. Uh, there was a, a general from the army, a senior person from the police, and so on. And. One of the reasons is, and uh, I think this needs to be looked at in more detail, but of course every year everybody in Finland works together to counter a known threat, which is the fact that the Russians are just across the border. 
And they all know one another. They know the strengths and weaknesses. They got the mobile phone numbers. And when COVID came, they all knew one another. And it worked really, really well. But you can't do that in the UK. You can, no. <laughs> but you can do it at local level. You could do it in Manchester. You could exactly. do it in... Exactly. Well, that's why the yeah. integrated care that's systems right. are a good scale. Yeah. You know, they're a good scale at which to work at a local level. But we've just had the evidence by, you know, Andy Burnham yesterday at the, the yes, COVID inquiry. Yeah. I mean, the, this inquiry, watching every evening because it's just so illuminating. And the fact that they were just shut out. Yeah. I think um, I remember reading that... that um, that regions that had better trust and relationships fared better in COVID, though. There were clearly inequalities another, as well. Clearly. So where, where you have those foundations of trust and relationships. And just another example of how it works. So um, I'm a great believer in co-production, mm -hmm. co-creation. And in a study, we I do a lot of work in cardiovascular. Most of my research is outside the UK. But we've got this big multi-country cardiovascular study. And we worked for a year with local communities in the poorest areas of Malaysia and Colombia to develop an intervention to deal with hypertension. Now, both of the communities faced major problems, but they were different. Mm -hmm. But essentially what we did was we had simplified medicines, we had simplified guidelines, we had peer support, uh, and we had mid-level health workers. And we designed it with them. They, they designed it. And when we did a big cluster randomized control trial, we got fantastic results. Mm -hmm. And similarly, we're doing work on self-sampling for cervical cancer at the minute, screening, because you know if you don't have the laboratory facilities and so on, there are ways, things to do that. We're working with disadvantaged um, women in a number of places in Europe, R Russian, Estonians in Narva, sex workers, Romania, and so on and so forth. And, and when you actually talk to people who, the struggles you say, well, you know, just take a, a sample, put it in the post, Where's the post box? Yeah. You know, we, we don't have a post box. We're living in containers in the middle of nowhere. Well, in a... We may not have post boxes yeah, I know. where the post office is going. Yeah. So one of the big questions that's <laughs> coming out of this is not only how do we work cross government to get some consistency, but how do we learn from other countries mm -hmm. what has worked there that we could um, bring in? And... Uh, and I think I'd add to that a third question. There are good examples of lots of things all around the country, but we're very bad at scaling. Yeah. Yeah. And so I did think quite a bit about the bank, but clearly not all these ramifications. One of the reasons we thought a disruptive effort like that might uh, could be very helpful was because it could pick up on, oh, so they say that works. Let's just evaluate it and then recommend it, and, yeah. and here's some money coming in through the levy or from something. Oh, uh, occupational health done like this seems to work. Now, all employers, you've got to get the same outcomes, and you could use this and move to a much more outcome-based, employers working much more on the health of their people. Um, because actually that would save them a lot of money too. And that happens in Finland too, where you've got occupational health, social services and health all working together. Yeah, so, you know, there are three difficult questions and we hoped that a bank or something equally dis disruptive, I was about to say destructive, disruptive <laughs> would help on some of this. It, it might be that it's a commission, but I mean, you know, something to bring it together. Another question. Question there. Thank you, uh, Catherine Faulkner. Um, I'd say my question, you've talked quite a lot about localization, decentralization and those sorts of things, but I haven't heard the word director of public health mentioned yet. <laughs> and I'm just really interested where you sort of see them and their role uh, and local government sitting mm. within this bank? Because I think there are some really good examples locally of, of actually getting health and all policies working. But I think I, I completely agree with you, Sally. What we're missing is the, the sort of strong national direction. But I just wondered if anyone had a comment on that. Thanks. So I've carefully skirted around that, Catherine, <laughs> um, because I think that um, public health is a very mixed bag. And where we've had a, a massive failure is in um, giving in austerity, the public health budgets out and, and losing out. Um, and I think that some, and may, it might well be many public health directors could play a big role in this, but I actually want it to be that employers do it, that the housing people do it, that everyone does it, and that public health directors may be a conductors, but that everyone's working at it. 
And that's why I hadn't put public health at the front. It is about the public's health because of everything we do. And they bring an expertise, and some of them are great leaders. But there will be other people who could lead this. And, and I'd like to add to that. I think one of the fo foci of focuses of public health is health inequalities. But I think sometimes that cart rather drives the horse. I think that it, it ends up with a focus that all you want to do is produce health and reduce health inequalities. But actually what you want is health as an input into other things, yeah. other things as an input into health. And many of the public health folk that I interact with as an economist don't see the picture in the way the economists do, which is these interlinkings and this over-focus on inequality rather than actually trying to get the mean up as well as reduce the dispersion. Which is why we in the European Observatory have just published a policy brief on co-benefits uh, to address exactly this. But as given I'm a professor of public health, I suppose I should say something. <laughs> and I have to say, uh, back in 2012, I was completely, I and my colleagues were completely puzzled as to why the public health was being put into local government. And of course, it was because if you were moving towards what I think was in Andrew Lansley's mind, although who knows, who really knows, uh, you were, and where you had the uh, primary care bodies eff effectively morphing at some point into competing insurance companies. So I struggled to understand it. And I actually bought David Cameron's autobiography to try and find some elucidation. And I was reassured to know that he actually says that he didn't understand it. Either. <laughs> but we trusted Andrew because he'd been studying it. for It's worth reading. And uh, so I think the, the challenge is that there was a lot of nostalgia in the public health community of going back to the good old days. But the problem was the good old days were never that good. First of all, in the old days, local government actually did a lot of things. It did education, it did social uh, services, it did a whole series of things. We're now in a world where you had, was it Barnet Council, Easy Council? You've got Westminster. It is essentially a car parking company uh, organization with a, a local some bits of local government attached. You know, this is the real challenge. We've moved on from those days. And I think there are some brilliant directors of public health in the country. But as Walter Holland, the late Walter Holland, uh, who remembered that time, said there were some really good bits like your predecessor, Liam Donaldson's father, uh, Paddy Donaldson up in the, the north of England. There were some fantastic ones, but there were some that were really not very good at all. And I think it's a very variable situation. And I, I think, you know, it's just fallen between all the different stools and we have a problem and the, the budgets, are, which are pathetic. I think we've got time for one more question. At the back. Um, it's one of two quick questions. One, one is I'd be interested in Martin uh, and Carol's view on the future costs of healthcare system, because I'm hearing that the inflation in costs is about four to five percent. And if we just keep the show on the road, we're only 10, 15, 20 years away from doubling the cost of healthcare systems, which means we'll be increasing tax anyway to keep a current broken system going. There's some kind of madness in thinking mm -hmm. that we can't invest now to improve things but we're going to end up paying for it anyway. So well, I'd be interested in your view on the future. One opportunity for possibly the bank, I think, is this, this early of opportunity of early prevention. So there's a lot of work being done to identify uh, biomarkers that indicate the early onset of chronic disease. Mm -hmm. And if we could take advantage of that and head people off from uh, expensive chronic disease earlier as possible, that seems like a really fruitful opportunity, but it requires primary care to play a greater role. We know there's not enough capacity and in investment. So that could be a really rich and fertile area for something like the, the bank that you're talking about. So just a, a thought there. I mean, yes, it is scary. The US is talking about spending 30% of their GDP on healthcare in not very long time, which is clearly unsustainable. Um, and in the US, that basically means that you're, in, you're requiring more and more out of employers because that's how most people's uh, health insurance is paid for or through taxation for those over 65. So it, it's just a crazy situation. I agree totally. We really have to focus on prevention. But we really need to get the pub. I mean, that, and that really requires use of data. 
because that's the way you're going to be finding the kind of things that you're talking about. So we really need the kind of discussion that we talked about a little bit earlier about public trust in their data being used to find out these things and then implement them. And we have to do that step in Britain. We have to get our politicians understanding that data and health data, but not just health data, the joining up of data really will be something transformative. And if we don't do that, we're really stuck. We're also really stuck, I think, because it's quite clear, I'm from Imperial College. So at Imperial, the best scientists increasingly are going to the big tech giants. Why? Because the big tech giants have access to data, which means they can do fantastic revolutionary things, not, not spying on people things, but actually discovering things that we could do with our data in the UK because we've got a lot of administrative data. But there's this reluctance to even bring it together. There's this reluctance to put tax data together with employment data or even put it together with health data. We really have to crack that. And I think that's part of the key to unlocking the spending problem. And it's, it's part of the key to unlocking better health. And I think part of that is a discussion with the public, because I know you're going to come in on the public, about privacy. Yeah, yeah. We should aim for privacy of data. It's not about anonymity or confidentiality. It's about privacy. And we have yet to see someone put in prison for doing the wrong thing. How are they going to trust a system if they don't see that we really mean it? Over to you. Yeah, I was actually going to comment on the biomarkers, <laughs> right. but but a, a, absolutely, I don't think we've shown that we steward data well enough. We've had um, plenty of problems, and and even if the NHS does it really well, or the, the, we've still got the mood music in the background of fear about tech mm. giants and their use of our data that's sort of playing out. I mean, I think the point about biomarkers and early detection of chronic disease is great. You've still got to have the services there to support people once you've done the early detection and then you come into poverty, inequality and those wicked issues that, um, that you still need to have sort of addressed if you're going to help people once you've identified. But we have to take trust seriously. And uh, it will be a major theme. This I talked about the Talon conferences. We have another one in the week after next. Um, and it will be about trust and transformation. Mm -hmm. But I think if governments want people to trust the data, then in their procurement of contracts, they should put a criteria in. If I give my contract to company X, will it undermine trust in the data? And without getting into any particular contract <laughs> that we've had recently, I think if that clause had been in the procurement, which is perfectly easy to do in public procurement, then somebody else might have got the contract. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, Minister, um, you've had a, a, a very uh, enterprising and exciting proposal. You've heard it stress tested um, and questioned and uh, counter, you've had counter suggestions, but now's the time for you to decide. Uh, and here technology is going to be our friend. Um, there's a QR code on your screens and um, what you have to do is to point your phone at it. Uh, those of you who are online can find a link to the poll in the comment section on YouTube or LinkedIn. Uh, those of you in the room, point your camera at the QR code, then tap the image of the code on your mobile screen, and you've got, you can see the question, and you've got three options. Uh, the first is supporting the ad adoption of the National Health Bank by 2040. The UK government should legislate and invest resources to establish the National Health Bank. Uh, option two, take it up a notch, the UK government should expedite the establishment of the National Health Bank, aiming to achieve its objectives by 2030. And the third is to take a different path. We should prioritize exploring alternative approaches. So 2030, do something else, or 2040. And we will give it a few more Seconds to. You should have had a fourth status quo. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're making people vote for change. We are. We regardless are. of what the change is. Yeah. Well, Sally, 
I think the voting has the, the votes are in, <laughs> and um, you have been tremendously persuasive tonight, mm. and you have won the audience round to the most radical um, pass, <laughs> God. Um, which is very exciting. Um, congratulations! Thank you, audience, for voting for taking yeah. your role as minister very seriously, um, and um, thank you to the panel for being such um, good. Um, inquisitors and testers and uh, counter suggestions. It's been a really, um, if all ministers were so served, as well served by uh, <laughs> having their ideas stress tested, the uh, the, uh, the government of this country might be a better place. It so would. I, I've just got a few um, closing remarks. First is to again thank Nesta uh, and uh, thanks to all of you uh, in person and uh, online for coming along to see this. Um, the Dreadwords feedback survey. Um, there is a feedback survey, which is either online in a chat box, um, or again, if you want to use your mobile phone. Um, oh, would, they, they, uh, there may be, oh, there it is. There's a feedback survey. If you if you want to, if you're the sort of person who likes to feed, um, do feedback service, um, there it is. Um, and this wraps up the the, the this. Um, Episode as well. This is series one um, of um, of the Minister for the Future, and and just to remind those of you who have been on the, this journey, the first one we looked at uh, open tech ne- monopolies, uh, how to open up tech monopolies. The second one was about food of the future. The third one was uh, with David King talking about refreezing the and the uh, the Arctic, uh, and then this one today. Um, now, what else? Um, I, uh, I think the most positive thing that's come out of this is the, this idea of having a minister for the future has been um, a really inspired idea. Mm. Uh, and I think you've seen why from today's um, debate about the, the tendency of governments to be stuck in the past or to be obsessed by the present and what a liberating thing it is to have these kind of discussions uh, about what the future might look like. Um, and the final thing I think uh, I have to say is just a plug for Prospect, because um, they employ me. Um, uh, and uh, there's an amazing offer at the moment. So if you uh, have often been tempted by Prospect, um, now is the moment to see it, because normally a digital subscription for Prospect costs £49. Um, but if you sign up today, you can have an amazing subscription for a year for only £25. So again, uh, if you point your screen at that QR code, if you're online, click the box in the chat box um, because this is an offer that is too good to mix, uh, too, too good to miss. Um, yeah, so it's, a, it's a very good magazine, even though I said it myself. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, and now the best bit of the evening is we all go upstairs and drink prospects and Nestor's wine. So a um, big hand for the panel and for Sally. <laughs>